Hi guys, my name is Angel and welcome to another episode of of Blood, Bones and Water. Today's episode is titled, What Do We Do to Eve? And this explores every topic about the women's reproductive organs and our system. Of course, with me here is Zena Balogu, and I'm so excited because the last time we met, <laughs> I was on your seat. I know, we <laughs> traded places. Yes. Has it, has it been a year? It has. About. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah, I think it was, was in October. the last time I physically saw you. Yeah. That is <laughs> And amazing. this is such a full circle moment to it have is. you on my seat this time. I know. How... how does it feel like i know you've done a few episodes already mm-hmm. right so actually i'm not supposed to be interviewing you you're <laughs> supposed to be interviewing me back have it okay well, to be fair i'm a little bit anxious i mean before i went for big brother and everything i had seen like your page a few times so to be like the one now interviewing you it's like wow this is awesome but i'm all here for growth and that's what this is thank you so much for coming to the podcast uh, like i said this episode is about like fertility issues the women reproductive system in general and um you know i had seen like one of your punch was it yes Yes. it was an an interview right yes where you spoke about your struggle with you know endometriosis i don't know if i pronounced (laughs) endometriosis you got it it takes a few a few times um what what was that like wow um so i feel like you know finding out that i had endometriosis was um you know one of the biggest moments of my life Mm -hmm. Um, if I was to kind of take you back on the journey to even getting there, to getting to the diagnosis, it took about just over 20 years. I saw that in the article and I was like, wow, 20 years. Uh, It took a long time. Um, you know, I started my period when I was about 11, 12 and Mm -hmm. I, I was prepared to start my period. So, you know, I was in school in the UK and we had done like this sex education course, So in that, you know, they teach girls about their bodies and teach boys about theirs and, you know, preparing for menstruation. And we, and we got these little packs that had like mini tampons and it had like mini pads. You know, we actually need that in our own education system. So I, I got that pack like maybe a week or two weeks before. So I remember I was in the shower and then, you know, I just saw blood and I was shocked, but also kind of excited because this was the beginning of becoming a bigger girl, if that makes sense, right? Finally. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a bit of a late bloomer. So, you know, I never had like boobs and and hips and stuff like that. So anyway, um, I called my sister and I told her that, you know, I've seen blood and she was like, you know, just taking me through, come down. And I, I had my little pack. So from then I've had a very interesting relationship with my periods because they've always been painful. From the age of 12. Like regular pain. Regular, steady, intense One that Because you know that there's like... There's different levels, right? You know there's the normal... I won't say average because it's still crazy. And then there's another one that just doesn't make sense. I'm talking... I would bleed because my periods were for seven days, right? (sighs) And that's seven days of pain and discomfort. Then there's the ovulation pain as well. So I'm talking about maybe about two weeks or so of mm-hmm. pain. Um, and ovulation pain is different to period and cramps kind of pain. So the kind of pain that I would experience were, um, the way I would describe it is like literally somebody taking like a, you know those barbed wires that you put on top of fences, the ones that have like little sharp like, like crown bits. of thorns crown of thorns kind of barbara is literally taking that and like turning it in my stomach like over and over like just cutting and ripping so it was more than just your basic cramps it was the kind of pain that would prevent me from going to school i would have to literally lie in my bed i'd be rolling around in my bed in pain um it would prevent me from going to work um i would literally be hunched over standing up would be very difficult at times um, I remember just, you know, sometimes just kind of like passing out from pain because at a point yeah. your body's like, I'm tired. The only thing that will resolve this for now is you just shutting down. I would take all different types of painkillers, whether it was anti-inflammatory, ibuprofen, paracetamol. Uh, uh, um, what's what's There was another one that I used to get from Nigeria. Oh, my gosh. Um, eh, Thelvin, yes. Uh, so I would try all different types of painkillers, but the pain would just be too strong. Mm -hmm. So 
I think by the time I got to like college, I went to see my GP and, you know, they, they said first they thought I had IBS, which was irritable bowel syndrome. Um, then they thought I had another kind of like gastro issues, um, that was leading up to the, the, the cramps and the pain. Finally, I was then diagnosed with, um, dysmenorrhea. So dysmenorrhea is what you call, it's somewhat severe painful periods. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at times they say it's either a uh, hereditary because I remember my mom used to tell me that she used to have really, really bad. My mom has the worst. She really, throws really, up she and throws everything. Up. Yeah, yes. everything. Throwing up, sweating, all different uh, types of pain. So I, even back then, I, rem I remember my mom saying to me that, oh yeah, you know, don't worry. The pain will sort of reduce when as you, you have grow, kids. Or if you grow older. Yeah. Or as you get older. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, <sighs> Okay, well, I'm in university. This is not the time for me to, you know, have kids. So I have to kind of suffer through this. So I went through several different types of diagnosis. I, I, I remember receiving, being prescripted, um, you know, uh, uh, these kind of painkillers that were for um, people who had, um, gosh, what is that? Like uh, arthritis, mm -hmm. right? And even that wouldn't work. I would throw up the medicine that they would give me. So that went on for 20 something years until 20, I believe it was, yeah, until 2020. And, and I, that was, that isn't even been a long time. That hasn't been a long time. And yeah. I would have regular periods like, you know, once a month, but early 2020, I remember there were two months where, um, I had essentially like four periods, which was very abnormal for me. So the first month I had two periods in a month. Sorry, could you break that, break that the down. math? Right. So the first month I had two periods okay. in a month. Um, so I went, I bled for 14 days. So not straight. So the, at the beginning of the month, my period came, I had my seven days, then it went, then let's say within a week, it came back again. So that was very abnormal for me because my periods mm -hmm. are relatively, um, you know, on, on calendar. So it happened again in, so this was July, 2020. It happened again in August. And that was what prompted me to try and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that was me trying to listen to my body because this wasn't normal. Um, you would think it would be easy for me to find a gynecologist that I could just go to, but even that was difficult. Because a lot of times, I don't know if they try to deviate from the matter at hand with most gynecologists. They tell you, oh, you're fine. It's normal. Right. But it isn't. It's not normal because yeah. as women, we have to fight you know, to be seen and for our pain to be felt. So in the 20 years that I essentially probably had endometriosis i had doctors and people telling me oh you know it's okay the pain will, oh, will you're fade being dramatic. Or you're being dramatic i remember there was one time i had a female um uh gp and i didn't like the way she treated my case because she, she was tried, downplaying she my pain it, yeah. and she felt like because she was a woman she could do that because ah, she beat me too i've had period pain <laughs> i'm like nah that's not it's how not it the goes. same thing yeah so the next time i actively said i want to see a male gp because he's not going to be able to tell me that oh i can um i can sympathize with you because i'm a woman he's a man and he's gonna have to take my case for what it is yeah um so once i was back to being in Nigeria. So I had to find a gynecologist, which wasn't easy. Not to say that they're not around, but I needed one that was going to be safe for me. You know, Attentive. Attentive. Sensitive. Sensitive. Yeah. Plus the fact that I'm a personality, mm -hmm. someone who I wouldn't, you know, hear my case on Twitter. Because I remember there was a time where there was a thread where, you know, this particular gynecologist was talking about one of his patients. Really? Yeah. He, what, he, happened they, they, what happened what? to patient confidentiality? What happened to patient confidentiality? Exactly. So um, I asked around, asked my girlfriends, and I discovered that a lot of women didn't actually have one particular gynecologist that they use or they could recommend. Because again, we don't get taught to look at, you know, to look at our sexual health or our reproductive health earlier enough. And the stigma as well. And the stigma too. Mm -hmm. And a normal doctor is not the same as a gynecologist, right? So um, not to say that, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing, but I needed someone specific that was going to mm -hmm. tell me the things about my reproductive health. So I did a few searches. Um, I even, I remember checking Twitter threads 
um, and looking for women who were talking about who they saw. And I remember one person spoke about the the doctor that I ended up going to, uh, Dr. Kemi De Silva, uh, Ibu. So she is from the Breast and Gynae Center in Victoria Island. Um, I had another friend who had recommended her and, you know, they said great things about her. So I went to see her and she was just absolutely perfect. Like she was like, okay, clearly your mind is telling you something, something is wrong. wrong. So let's just go through the due process. And the due process is we'll do some scans. Um, we tend to go through a list of things first. So there's an order you'll go through, you know, whether or not it's fibroids, we'll check for fibroids, then, you know, we'll check for um, cysts. Then the last thing on the list was endometriosis. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe it'll be one of the things that's at the top of the list and we'll yeah. be all right. So I did the... Um, uh, did the test. Uh, we first did an ultrasound and which is where they basically take the gel and they look, you know, at your stomach from top down. So after that, the radiologist was like, Oh, okay. You know, everything sort of seems all yeah. right, but uh, I feel like I want to do a TVS. So a TVS is what you call a transvaginal scan. And it's somewhat of an ultrasound. And what they do is they take a device and they put it inside. So fucking uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I've done so many now that I'm like, when, when I'm sitting there, I'm like, are you done? So it's, yes, it's a bit of a long device um, and it goes inside and it allows them to kind of see, you know, a lot better. Mm -hmm. So when he got in there he, and I, I was watching the screen and he was like, okay, so I can see two cysts. There's one on the left-hand side of, of your ovary that measured about 90 millimeters or so. Then there was one on the right-hand side, which is a lot smaller. So, and he also said that he can kind of see like some, um, uh, he could see some, uh, I think whether it was like a coating or he could see that it had fluid in it, but mm -hmm. he couldn't tell what kind of fluid. So once I saw her, um, she was able to tell me that, yes, we have this cyst on the left-hand side, which is a lot bigger that, you know, for her, it makes her quite uncomfortable. We need to take care of it. And it was what they classified a torsion cyst. So that's a cyst that's twisted, hanging on the ovary. So the reason why they were panicked was because, one, they don't know what's inside of it. Two, if it continues to twist, it could essentially burst. And three, if it's twisting, the weight of that on that ovary isn't, you know, something that you want to look forward to. So that's what also influenced the pain. The right hand side, they had mentioned that, you know, that's what they call like a simple cyst. You know, it's not, it's not really doing anything. It's just there. Mm -hmm. So we had to plan for emergency surgery. Um, this was now say November, if you remember the NSARS, um, you know, I can't even imagine uh, having to deal with that while deal with that's that yeah, was going while on. that was happening. So yeah. I was scheduled for surgery, emergency surgery, on the day after uh, November 20th. So imagine we had to get like an emergency letter that said we could move because at that point there was like lockdown yeah. on the streets. So there I am packing my stuff for surgery and it all, it's all not really clicking for me at this mm -hmm. point. So we leave the house and the streets are like empty. Things are on fire. Like there's debris everywhere. Like it's a ghost town. And I'm like, God. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> um, so go in for surgery. Um, at that point, you know, I'd already met the surgeon, Dr. Ojoku um, mm -hmm. from AVLSC Surgery in Lekki. Again, amazing. Um, uh, Dr. Kemi had said to me, you know, she sends all her patients to him and, uh, uh, I remember him saying to me that the reason why she chooses me is because I send her patients back to her. I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to wake up. Um, so after seeing him, uh, we we pretty much got prepared for surgery. I went in, I did a laparoscopic surgery, uh, which is basically where the surgeon doesn't necessarily, it's not open surgery. So they go through my belly button. Uh, with devices his hands don't physically go inside my body he literally just uses the tools and mm -hmm. a camera to see and um, they were able to kind of take care of the cyst then so when I woke up I was in and out of sleep and I remember him having a conversation with my husband and like I was just you know I, I remember a line him saying something You're like married yeah, yeah yeah oh my god I never knew that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I am wow yes I am um I have Two kids. I, I'm very, my personal life is, is very, very much very, off social yeah, yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I remember uh, him 
he said something like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe when she wakes up, we'll have the conversation. And I fell back asleep. So when I woke up, I looked under my gown and I saw the um, the bandages. I saw three bandages. So there was one by my belly button and then it was two where my ovaries were. And in my mind, I had a, I had a thought for a second because I thought about endometriosis. I don't know why. Because I was expecting to see one or two, not three. Mm-hmm. And when you do a laparoscopic for endometriosis, there are three signature points. So um, there, there's having three bandages and t- that it's a, it's sort of tied to endometriosis. So once I woke up fully, um, the doctor said to me that you know they went and they took care of the cysts. However, they noticed that I had endo lesions, which are little small cells, uh, um, and they were pretty much on my ovaries, the fallopian tube, um, they had spread to my intestines, uh, diaphragm, and he then mentions the word endometriosis. At that point, I started to cry because I was like this one thing that mm-hmm. I was, that was at the bottom of the list it's that I was, it's, you know, afraid of is what we're going to have to deal with. And it wasn't stage one. It was stage three. So endometriosis is basically where you have, um, you know, the lining of the uterus cells, yeah. you know, growing outside, um, uh, outside of the pelvic area. And, um, you know, they, they, it happens in stages because it depends. The stages are determined based on where these cells occur. So mine had spread outside of my pelvic area and was moving up to, you know, my diaphragm and whatnot, which is why it was classified as like stage three. So I remember just thinking to myself that, damn, how did I get here? What did I do? Like, what did I eat? What did I consume? Mm-hmm. Like, naturally, questioning. a lot of questioning, naturally blaming myself. Was there also anger towards the people that did not take you seriously? At that point, I didn't even think about them. Mm-hmm. Um it wasn't until I understood this, the disease a bit more that I was like, why Why did it take so long to get here? 20, why why 20 did years you do 20 lot. years mm-hmm. of, oh, it's this, oh, it's not that, oh, it's not that. Why hadn't I, I think there was only other one time that I heard about endometriosis and that was through, um, you know, uh, the supermodel Milen. And I remember her talking about it. But again, I didn't really pay much attention Attention at the time Mm -hmm. um, to even uh, see how intense and severe it is. So after surgery, I had to be placed on a treatment, a Zolodex treatment, which is basically a um, it's an estrogen blocker. So what what endometriosis is, is that it feeds off of estrogen. So it's also when you're estrogen dominant. So my body produces a lot of estrogen. And by getting the Zolodex, um, what that does is it blocks the production of estrogen and puts your body in a state of menopause. So you have all the symptoms and joys of menopause before you, you know, your body is actually yeah, ready to actually, do so. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, doing that treatment meant that the plan was to be able to kind of take care of some of the cells um, in the process uh, because they were able to remove some of those cells in surgery. So I went through that for a year. Um, I had two doses. Um, so that meant no periods for a year, menopause, insomnia, hot flashes, um, anxiety, um, you know, a little bit of... So now you're having like, you know, when your thyroid is either like hyper, because I have thyroid issues. That's right. exactly what it That's looks what like. you deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm dealing with uh, spontaneous rashes. Like I remember after when I got home, the first symptom, because the, the the surgeon had said to me that you're going to see, you're, you're going to experience symptoms. Mm-hmm. But the first one I remember was looking in the mirror and just literally see my boobs do this. One was bigger so than the one, other. So one was higher than the other. The other had like Dro- literally dropped. And I was just looking, I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> no, because for real, <laughs> I would have been shook. Like, what the hell? Um, so you then remember that estrogen is responsible for so many things. It's a womanly hormone, it's Mm -hmm. collagen, it's elasticity, it's 
everything, every little fiber that makes the beauty in you, right? Um, I remember having a rash, like I had a rash across my my, my side. Um, it just popped up out of nowhere. I couldn't sleep. I would be sitting somewhere and I'm suddenly hot and I'm like, I need to take off all of my clothes. Like I'm burning, I'm on fire. Um, I remember losing my hair. That was like the biggest thing for me. I know, because every time I see your face, just like, like my I hair, love my hair. My, you love like, my hair. Like, oh my God. Like, I had a video where in the sink, like I was I was just detangling my hair and just hair filled up the sink all over the place. Because Olodex is also, you know, it's it's very intense. So it's, it's also used for, say, people who have like cancer, like breast cancer mm-hmm. and things like that. So it has those symptoms. Um, so I was on that for a year, um, the anxiety, the, I remember going to body image, the body image. Um, I went to, I was with my relatives. It was, I think it was one of my nieces birthday and, you know, we're family people. So everybody is all around. And I remember just sitting there at some point and just feeling like I can't be here. I need to leave. I feel very uncomfortable. I'm not. These are my family members. Like and this people would never, you obviously wear comfortable around. People I'm comfortable around. So why would I suddenly be in my head? And I remember just saying, yeah, I need to leave. I did, didn't make any sense. But that was anxiety. That was the mood swings. Um, so I did that for a year. And then after that, I was able to... Uh, the, the, the implant sort of dissolves in your body. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I had to just wait for my period to come back. So in August, I remember, um, you know, I, I was somewhere and, it, you know, went to the restroom and, you know, do you see a little little spot? And I'm like, your period. <laughs> Who are you? Like, you ain't seen you in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Called my friends. Um, I was like, guys, it's back. It's back. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it comes back in grand style. Um relatively no pain so you know feeling very different feeling very happy like I remember that year of not having my period I was extremely happy because it meant that no pain no pain Mm -hmm. like I could function I didn't have to turn down gigs I didn't have to explain to people why I was acting the way I was acting or why I was in my head so it felt really good as well um despite the symptoms so once my period came back um you know, everything sort of aligned. Um, and then I, I felt like I needed to talk about this. Yeah. Um, like, and in talking about it, I realized that the stories that I received from women going through similar things or uh, discovering they had other issues. And not knowing. And not knowing or yeah. not talking about it or being blamed. Or those by, that don't even have access to healthcare. Don't have access to healthcare. Um, like crazy stories. Like, and, and some of these women were speaking to me from private or secret accounts because they were worried that, you know, maybe their mother-in-laws or family member, somebody might find husband. out. Or husband. And, um, and that like makes me wonder like, was that like the hardest part for you when you got your diagnosis? Because a lot of women, their, would I say womanhood mm-hmm. is tied to how good they are in the kitchen right. or what their reproductive systems can do. Right. Do you think that was like a defining moment for you when you got your so, diagnosis? So because I have such amazing like family and like my in-laws are absolutely amazing. I never, that thought never crossed my mind. Um, and I'm also pretty resilient to an extent. So yes, the diagnosis did kind of, um, it weakened my exterior because here I was exposing myself here. I Mm -hmm. was telling people that I'm not perfect, like smile and I'm giddy, but there are times when I've had to go to events and I'm in crazy pain or where I've had to have, you know, accidents in public because my, my flow was just like crazy heavy. Um, but we sometimes as women we are we're kind of positioned to be ashamed of things that What's kind of we are positioned <laughs> for everything we're, we're body wise sex wise yeah, everything we're positioned to yeah. be ashamed um and really not look for answers and me sharing my story was my way of just telling women listen to your bodies and ask questions like it's okay it's okay for you to 
um, be concerned about this thing. Everything doesn't, because I know that when I started sharing my story, a lot of people looked at it from the, they looked at the infertility point. And I was like, this is not even why I'm telling you guys. Yeah. Infertility, yes, is one of the potential, um, you know, fallouts of having endometriosis. But I've never thought that, you know, I'm I'm infertile or I'm never going to have kids or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that's never been an issue. So me sharing was because I wanted to educate people to look after. We look after everything else. You brush your teeth every day. Well, at least I hope you do. Um, you know, you... You do your hair. You take care of the outwardly a- appearance. Why are we not concerned about those regular checkups, those regular scans mm-hmm. as women? Yeah. To be honest, yeah, I feel like we struggle with so much as a woman, you know. Mm. I can't imagine a pain worse than the normal period pain because i won't lie mine has me on my bed as well and i've done pap smears thinking yeah. i've been trying to have cancer <laughs> or even done all the other extensive tests right. and it's just your regular period period and then there's people suffering from like pcos mm-hmm. there's people suffering from you know endometriosis there's other reproductive issues as well that people you know, shame us for having. Mm-hmm. There's people that tell you, as, and you know, a lot of women are more concerned about the fertility part because some of those women haven't had kids mm-hmm. and maybe sometimes they actually don't even have any intention of having kids. But because society has tied you being a woman to either... To producing. Yeah, and I'm producing reduced, alone. Yes, to either you're able to have kids or you're able to cook in the kitchen. There's a lot of anxiety surrounded around reproductive issues i have some of my friends that don't even want to go to the gynecologist wow for several reasons they're anxious or you know they don't want to find out that something Something, is actually wrong with them and you know like how was the anxiety like for you so um i think because again i've never really i've never really kind of shied away from asking questions or going to the doctor and, um, you know, finding out things. So it wasn't, I wasn't anxious about what I would find out. So even when I first saw the gynecologist, you know, I didn't panic about, oh my God, what's the worst case scenario? Because I've done pap tests and I've done them like all the time. Um, you know, I've done screenings and cervical screen, uh, cervical, uh, cancer screenings. So, I think the the point in which the anxiety and fear kicked in was waking up and looking down and seeing those bandages after surgery and then hearing the word endometriosis. Um, there were times when I was, uh, I, I think my brain kind of like kicked into gear, like, okay, this is where we, this is where we fight. Like, this is where mm-hmm. um, you don't just stop and kind of like crawl into a corner and be like, I'm going to ignore it because it's, it doesn't go away like that. You have to now actively make certain changes. You have to make certain lifestyle changes. Like during that year being on the, the, the implant, you know, I had to stay away from what you call phytoestrogens, which are natural based estrogens in, in, in foods. Um, I had to stay away from foods that were, you know, processed or had been pumped full of hormones. Um, and, these are things that I love to eat and I'm a foodie. Oh my God. So it was very you hard. You had a lot of lifestyle changes. I had, yeah, there were a lot of lifestyle changes. I had to listen to my body. I had to be kind to myself. I had to try not to be really hard on myself. Um, even explaining myself to people because like I said, there were times when I would have like productions or and I would suddenly feel kind of anxious about it or mm-hmm. not want to be there and feel like I'm self-sabotaging myself in this moment. Um, but I had to be okay with the fallout. When you were talking about your friends, your your friends who were afraid to kind of check, it prompted my mind to a story that came out in, in the press about this Instagram model. I don't know if you saw it. She's American and she discovered that she had AIDS and how did she discover she had AIDS she had lost a lot of weight she was really sick um I think she was like passing out and when I'm when I'm saying like bone kind of weight loss so it had gotten to that point that she passed out 
And she went to the doctors and everybody was trying to figure out what was wrong with her. First, Mm -hmm. they thought she had cancer. And then one particular doctor said, let's do a HIV and AIDS test. They did it. And that's when they discovered she had it. Now, in, in the doctor had said to her that you probably had this for like 10 years. And she said she's never done any checks. She's never done a HIV test in those years. She's never done any kind of like sexual trans. She doesn't know how she got it. She had a rough life. Um, she was raped a few times. She said, I can't even tell you when I got it or how I got it because her outwardly outwardly body looked okay up until the point where she was dead skinny and she had lost like a bit of her eyesight. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, you know, if this woman had a prompting just one time to do one test, yeah, she could have caught this a lot earlier. Like it's Did she pre- die? No, she's she, she's just alive. She's on medication. She's taking well, things every she single day. She would not. I point. mean, she's wheelchair bound now, but mm-hmm. she's doing better. She's had eye surgery, um, and she's you know she's an advocate. You know who's now speaking up about it, um, and prevention is always it's always better. Like you don't want to yeah. get to a point where it's gotten so bad that there's nothing that can be done. And I don't even think that, you know, like as women, we should be tied to what society thinks is womanly. Right. So there's so much shame and then there's so much stigma, you know, for like the basic things, so even things that have to do with yourself. So many women don't want to get tested. Mm-hmm. And that's not even it's not even tied out to women only, but like, I feel like the shame and the fear is heavier on women because, you know, you have all these body count topics and how mm. a woman is a slut. And you also have like, you know, all these topics about who a woman is. And if she's not able to give birth, it means something is wrong with her. Right. When, to be honest, she's just existing as another type of woman. Because for me personally, I don't think there's any i don't think there's a way to be a woman i don't think there's a way to be a human being actually right so it's like you know there's so much shame and stigma associated with our femininity and what we do with our bodies there's so many women that are dying just Mm -hmm. from not being you know tested yeah i know how hard it was for you know a family friend of mine to go test for fibroids because you know, I call her my auntie, but she didn't want to get tested at the time because she hadn't gotten married. She was in her 30s, but she was struggling. And then, you know, she found out when after so much convincing that she had fibroids. And obviously that like impacted, impacted, yeah. you know, a lot of her body image. And it took a lot of, you know, you're not just tied to how many children you can conceive or mm-hmm. if you can't even conceive at all. You're a woman because you are simply a woman and that's it and i feel like and and that's why i wanted to have this conversation because we don't have it enough Mm. and so many women are ashamed to talk about things that bother them with their reproductive issues even stds yeah you know there's this notion that if you have stds it means means you've you've slept around right when you simply might have just slept with that one person Mm -hmm. that you probably trusted and that person gave you that you know so I think yeah. this conversation is so important because the stigma, um, literally, it's it's a death sentence a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think about when when you prepare to get married, you know, you you do all these tests, right? You do a HIV test. Sometimes in some of the churches, they request particular tests as well for the women and for 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 the women. <laughs> and it's like, why wait until that point? God forbid, okay, you did find out that you had HIV and AIDS. Is your, your marriage over? Mm-hmm. You know? So um, I say now, me sharing my story means me making it cool to be health conscious. Me making it cool for reproductive health to be a... Every time I go for a TVS, I on my Insta story, I'm like, this is a reminder. This is a reminder for you to do your scans. This take is that a, pap smear. Take the pap. Do the mammogram. Do yeah. the STD tests. Um, you know, do everything that is like you. You. We take our cars to the mechanic. Uh, you get an MOT done. Like, why would you not do the same for your body? Like, why would you just stop at, you know, an X-ray? Like, look inside and and. You know, make it a thing with your girlfriends. Like, you know, if you guys can go clubbing together, why the hell can you not all go to, to the, the clinic hospital, and do yeah. a pap test? Mm-hmm. And after that, you go get a cocktail and, you know, cheers it out. Like, um, 
It just needs to be normalized. Even having conversations about periods. Like I remember being uncomfortable when I when I would have like a boyfriend, like, oh, you know, you really want you wouldn't really want to tell him that, oh, I'm I'm on my period. Like even just saying that word, it sounded disgusting. Or, um, you know, I have really bad cramps today or I'm bleeding heavy today. Why should we be afraid? Some men don't even want to buy you pads. They don't even want to buy you pads. <laughs> like, like, girl. Why should we be afraid about that's talking a red about... Flag for me. It should be a red flag. If I tell listen, you God help you buy your pad. Listen. And you're doing... Oh, my God. The, the, oh, the people are going to... In the in aisle. Is, oh, stop. <laughs> like, I mean, if you can't have those kind of conversations with young boys or the men in your life, like... What are you really talking about? You don't have to go into detail. Women are freaking superheroes. Every month we wake up, we bleed, and we act like it's nothing. And I was so pissed when I saw on Twitter, someone was equating, I feel like blue balls is a myth. So, you know, there was someone equating... Who was trying to equate blue balls, blue balls to, to... menstrual cramps. And I was like... Better start. My cramps did not start. I started my period as well. Like, I think I was 12 on Christmas Day. It was the oh, worst... Oh, no! <laughs> it was oh. the worst day of my life. And then, I remember how bad it was. But I didn't get any cramps until I turned 18. Right. So, the rest of my period were pretty... Chilled. Oh, I'm on my period. Let's go. When I was 18, they became so bad that I had to also get tests done as well. Yeah. But I just found that that's mine. <laughs> My mom just passed mine to me, you know, and I just had painful periods. So when I saw that on Twitter, I wanted to cuss him out, but I was just like, you know what? You're kind of like a public figure now. So just, but he was like, blue balls kind of hurt like menstrual cramps. I'm like, who nah, are you son. to nah, tell nah, nah, us nah, nah, nah. something you have never experienced before? What's blue balls? And I've obviously, like I said, that's a myth as well, personally to me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like and just like y'all are lying. I Any like excuse to get up in there, honestly. Okay. Like I have blue balls because they hurt as much. No, they don't because like there's there's it's it's crazy because there's no one pain. This is not like the only type of pain. There are people that experience like there are women that experience zero to none. Right. There are women that have worse ones and mm -hmm. it just progresses. Mm -hmm. And there are women that can't function at at all. all. My mom. She will throw up. She's still on her bed. She mm -hmm. can't do anything. Roll around. And then when you ask, you know, workplaces to be a little bit more lenient, nope. they think you're being dramatic. Which is why I love, like, when I read about progressive um, changes, say, in the West. Uh, so, like, in, in Scotland now, it's sanitary wares are free mm -hmm. for women. We don't, like, we shouldn't even be buying pads. Like, why? Yeah. Um you know, there are certain places in Europe where they are testing uh, what they call period leave. So, you know, when you get your monthly flow, like if you have severe pain, you can have like two or three days off work that is paid. Um, it should be considered a matter that is a, that that is important for both men and women to kind of um, take on and, and have important conversations about. We just really need to not make it a women's thing and women's thing only. Like mm -hmm. it's an everybody issue. Like there's nothing. And, and because with endometriosis or maybe even period cramps, it's not an outwardly say pain or cut yeah, that you can, you see. can see. it. So maybe that's why also people are sort of like, oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal, but it, it is. is, it's, I, I say I have a high pain threshold because of endometriosis um i used to joke and be like labor pain is gonna be nothing because i know what pain feels like mm -hmm. um so i'm happy to share my story i'm happy for anyone that wants whatever anybody wants to take from what i say whether or not it's um, i i have i don't carry any shame when i talk about it yeah yeah what were your first symptoms like um, like so the defining moment where you're like, you know what, something is actually wrong with me. So when I, um, you know, I said when I had those two periods, I had two periods a month mm -hmm. across uh, July and August, that was a moment of, I need to find out what's happening because my periods were relatively, um, every month, like if it's the 20 something it's coming on the 20 something or I'm feeling, or I'm already having like pre- um, menstrual symptoms anyway. 
So that was a really big moment for me. I could have ignored it and be like, oh yeah, sure, you know, everything will come back normal, or maybe this is just stress and hormones. But I just wasn't comfortable. Like, and I wasn't, and I think I wasn't comfortable as well because my par- my periods are already difficult. So imagine having it twice a month. Like I wasn't about to kind of settle for that kind of pain. So it was painful periods. It was painful periods. I had a lot of bloating. Um I also had um, like body weight, like my my body changed, like I kind of filled out like heavily Mm -hmm. in in ways that I hadn't done so before or that I couldn't sort of connect with, oh, is it because I'm eating too much? much?" I was like, no, nothing has really changed. Um, The severe cramping during my period as well as during ovulation, like I would have sharp pains during ovulation. I thought you said I was normal. Well, I think the pain, I think there is a level of pain that you would expect from ovulation, but, mm-hmm. and then you also expect it to disappear at some point. Mine would literally again run for like seven days. And I'm like, why? Oh, we days. just, we just finished <laughs> seven days of bleeding and pain. Now we've gone to another seven days of ovulation and pain. This does not make any sense. Um, so those were the, and then heavy flows as well. Like when I say seven days of, I have five days and I'm always like, oh my God. I would have to use a tampon and a pad, um, chains. Like I could go through, I could legit back then go through like a tampon box of like those, those small pearl ones. Mm -hmm. Maybe like two and a half days. Maybe like two and, two, so and a half is, two and a half is even stretching it. And there's like 20 tampons. Nah, what did we really do to eat? Like, <laughs> like she, she legit, <laughs> she screwed it up. Honestly. You like, know, sis, wish you made better decisions, but okay. Because of an apple. Because <laughs> <laughs> of an apple. So, um, yeah, that's what I would go through. And like, I remember every time I would travel, like I would buy packs and packs of tampons and pads like I would buy an annual because I'm like I don't ever want to be somewhere I'd put it put it in my bags like every handbag has every crevice of my life the car it has a tampon it has a pad mm-hmm. because perhaps I don't ever want to make a mistake where I'm outside and something happens or I get a surprise like it's it's work it, it's it, it's not being it's not easy it's not easy at all to be a woman To function and work while on your period. Yeah. Immediately. You can't holiday when you want to holiday. Um, You know, you can't drink certain types of things or like just live your life. Like I remember I would miss certain moments in my friends' lives um, Mm -hmm. that I couldn't be there for because I was in pain. Um, The pain, the mood swings. The mood swings. and, and, And you'd hope that some people would understand um or even having relationships with guys like that's also you know i would kind of do that from afar because i'm like i have all of this you know going on and then you know meeting someone that doesn't make you feel different or make you feel uncomfortable because Mm -hmm. of what you experience or that and it's not that deep it's not supposed to be baggage it's not supposed to be baggage it's not supposed to be a thing where you're like, yeah, I'm not going to talk to you opposite sex. Honestly, <laughs> like, because, you know, part, one of the um, symptoms of uh, uh, of endometriosis is because of the hormonal imbalance of, like, being estrogen dominant, you'd have, like, different attitudes to sex, whether it's, like, l- low sexual desire or, like, libidos or, like, um, you know, uh, uh, that a difficulty was my next with, question, with, with uh, intercourse and things like that. Like, I remember... Mm-hmm. Some of the stories that I that I got from women is, you know, women who've had to break relationships or break marriages because it it was that hard for them. It was that painful or, um, you know, not having uh, a supportive partner that realized that this is this thing. is It's not by choice. It's the way you've been built and you're just trying to deal with the lot that you've been given Um and then on top of that, you have all the extra baggage of like, you know, how you should be, the kind of kids, how many kids you should have. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot. 
too. Four to it's, it's, it's a lot to kind of consume. For people or women that may have planned their life, you know, like exactly. when I'm 26, I want to have about four you kids. Know, <laughs> we all had those plans. And, psh, psh, those plans. Were I out. never had those plans. You know, I, I, I was like, oh yeah, by the time I'm like 25, I'm gonna have a kid. I'm, I'm, I'll be married and have a kid. And then, 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 then. 25 came. I was still enjoying my life. I was like, nah, it's not going to happen right now. I've never wanted to have kids. But yeah. like, I mean, it's my choice. So yeah. I can't imagine I'm having... I'm sure that's a whole nother... Yeah. It's a whole nother conversation. It's a whole nother conversation. Because every time I watch birthday videos, I'm like, oh my God, I cannot do this. Yeah. And my pain threshold it's is high. high. But every time I see birthday videos, I'm just like... When, when do you feel like you made the choice that kids were not for you? You know, I was thirteen. Really? Yes. And oh my god! I was in my I was in my computer science class. So you know, YouTube usually does this ad, or I don't know if it was YouTube. YouTube were using. I think we had YouTube when I was thirteen years. Right. It was twenty thirteen, and then I see this video. I don't know why I click on it, and I click on it, and I think it's an ad for something relating to childbirth. Okay. And it's so visual. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> First of all, I did not expect the hole to be that small. That was the first one for me. Second of all, I saw this. I feel like I was so traumatized, you know. So I was like, I'm never going to have kids. I'm never going to have kids. Then growing up, you know, that is much is is more than you know how small the hole is because mm-hmm. obviously you find out about dilation and right. how and all of that. It became a thing of like you have given birth and now you have to deal with depression after. Well, not all women suffer right, that, yeah. but there's a thing called postpartum depression. And there's some women that want to throw their kids away. <laughs> there's some women that don't love their kids at first. I'm just like, you know what? I'm already in a very fragile mental space. Mm. You know, I don't think I ever want to have kids. So I said this time, maybe I was like 16 and I had made this decision because wow. I'd found out. And then growing up, you know, obviously, like I said, my mental health got worse. So it's just like, I don't think I would be able to raise, you know, a child. And then I got to a point where I was like, Mm, maybe I would get better but I'm 22 now and every time people are like kids I'm just like whoa slow down and every time I have a partner you know that's the first thing I see I don't think I want to have you know kids but for me it's still a thing of my choice Mm -hmm. you know I don't ever want to wake up one day and be like you know I've changed my mind and I find out that I'm not fertile not because I've tied my worth to that but because you know I want to be able to make a choice choice. and i feel like that's what a lot of women who can give birth you know struggle with not being able to make that choice that choice and that honestly is crazy and you know i had the point as well where i struggled with you know having sex and because it was painful i didn't i didn't you know at a point i went to my gynecologist my gynecologist told me it was in my head and, you know, I started believing that as well because I have, like, a whole other story regarding trauma and sex and all of that. Right. But then even I knew that, you know what, it was, like, physical, or like, it was physical pain. And I just was like, yeah. You know, you, even with that, like, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the condition, um, whether it's called, oh God, forgive me. Is it Vaggie? There's vaginismus? Yeah, something like that. I know what you're talking about. You know, please, editor. It's, it's so if you, small. If you check the name, just put it on there for us. Yeah. Um, where, you know, naturally, vaginamus or vaginimus, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Where the vagina literally just like closes in at any opportunity yeah. where, you know, somebody's trying to, to, to penetrate. And there are women who have that and have no idea. They just assume... Um, I can't have sex, so I don't like sex, or you know, there's yeah. something wrong with me. Um, and and with it, with our culture, it is taboo to have those kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. We go from stay in school, focus, get your degree, your degree will never leave you, then to where's your boyfriend? Like, there's no, or where's your husband? There's no gap in between where, especially girls, yeah. are educated about what their lives should look like or um you know what their bodies or pleasures or 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 joy should even look like to them because most times the pleasure is centered around the men not really the women around the women right right so um that there are this is why this kind of dialogue is so important like 
there are people waiting to learn and you know the internet is is so vast like if we're not learning from each other you're just finding out from like random places so I would encourage you to definitely speak more about some of the things that you're experiencing especially for you know your demographic and the people who mm -hmm. love you and appreciate you um they they need to know that angel experiences life just like I do yeah no, because I don't know if you're seeing that TikTok <laughs> where the woman is like, the pressure is getting See, worse. Yes. <laughs> it when, is. I turned, when I turned <laughs> 22, you know, as, I mean, I, went to, I entered the Big Brother house when I was 21 mm -hmm. and I still have paying rent. I was like, what? Yeah. I was paying rent Welcome before. Welcome to the real life. But not on the scale that I'm paying rent <laughs> now. And then I bought a card. I was like, what? And then my car had issues. And I was like, what? There's more. There's yeah. more. Yeah. And then I turned 22. And now that woman came out with her TikTok. And in my mind, I'm just like, I'm 23. So I'm 24. Very soon, my granny will be asking me, where's your husband? I'm just like, yeah. Depression. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're still, you're young, you know? So while, yes, life is lifing around you, these are, these are the times when you literally just... You soak in as much as you can, mm -hmm. like, and while the pressure is building, like, you need to have those boundaries where you say, I'm not attaching myself to this. You know, this, this particular thing is not my responsibility or it's not my time for me to take this on and, and be as selfish as you want to be. Yeah. That is understandable. Okay, guys, we have come to the end of the podcast for today. And we're going to play a little game before we give Zainab her gift box. Okay. So the name of this game, I actually haven't named the game, but everybody plays it. Okay. So it's basically, you know, starts a song with a letter. Kind of like what you guys asked me to play. Did you guys ask me to play that? No, I'm not playing this one. This sounds very different. Okay. So you're going to if I say B now you're going to start a song with okay the baby, B. baby 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 I've not said B oh, okay <laughs> but shout like that right yes, like okay that. okay okay um letter F freakum dress the Beyonce song. song now the Beyonce does a freakum dress now but I that's the chorus <laughs> oh my god I'll pardon that because pardon it's Beyonce. okay okay um V. Myself, I don't wow. Know. Wow, no. no Do you have must. one? No. You must have one then. I don't have one. I just mentioned V. Um oh it doesn't start with V. But like I th wasn't you cannot just sang You got the vroom vroom if you want Nikki Manaj. Was he here? I think vroom, it was Hannah. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> I want you in my room. Um, no, that, that actually wasn't the song. Wow. No, it's if you want it, you got it, you got the vroom, vroom, or something. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, I know the song. Just when a boy, just when a boy left. Because it's something. Shout, shout out to me. But F was actually, that that wasn't a nice letter. F was a nice letter. No, V was not a nice letter, I mean. Now it's options. What's a Vilevile right now? It's no V that they do, it's stand. What if I said Z? Hmm. You see? It's not a nice letter. <laughs> okay, let me give you a nice letter. E. Even me, I know. <laughs> wow. Five. I'm also trying to sing something that's not vulgar, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. The little Mary, bless wow. you, money. <laughs> Stop going good. Shut up. I'm, I'm not good at this game at all. I, I can see how, how people get drunk on this game. The last one is, hmm. Let me give you one that's actually nice. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you easy letters, so I feel like all the vowels are easy. What are the vowels again? Why am I nervous? Um, D. No, a vowel is a consonant. Oh God. D. Let me give you a vowel. Um. I. I. I'm in love with you. <laughs> You said me. You go on. Oh, there we go. Beyonce comes in hand, you know. So, see, vowels are always a good idea. Um, so to end this podcast, thank you for playing the game. Thank you. We have.
this Yay, bucks from gifts, me gifts. to you. you. This is so and there's cute. A I love little it. Little written notes in it. Okay. Can I get? Do I get to read the of notes? Course. Okay. Of course. Oh, this is so cute. There's like a heating pad and everything. Oh, girl, this <laughs> is a good box. Okay, guys, so I'm gonna read what Angel wrote for me. Hi, Zainab. Thank you so much for coming to my podcast. I think you are a remarkable woman sharing your story and the things you struggled with in a society that tells us to be quiet and teaches us about shame. Thank you. And I appreciate you of blood, bones and water. Angel. Thank you. Oh, do you know what I would really love to try as we were doing that is ASMR. Let's try. So guys, I've had a great time on Angel's show. Have you? Yeah. Like it's so soothing. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.